Thank you all for coming to a, a special EOL seminar. We're honored to have Joe Sion from NOAA uh, here. Uh, Joe got his PhD in 1996 from North Carolina State University. And apparently, there must be a story about it, that he immediately became the deputy director of the US Weather Research Program. Uh, and I guess then moved on to a research meteorologist position. He's been at Hurricane Research Division for a while and now is just here, just uh, this summer, moved to Boulder in uh, Physical Sciences Division. Right? Yep. Uh, he's, as you'll, I'm sure, learn, is interested in air-sea interaction, air-sea boundary layers, uh, and is also highly interested in instrumentation, measurement systems. Uh, and his resume has two awards. One, uh, he, uh, he got a National Sea Grant Fellow uh, in 1993, and uh, in 2010 was recipient of the U.S. Department of Commerce Bronze Medal Award. So, welcome, Joe. Thank you. Well, thanks for, for uh, showing up here. Appreciate it. Um, as I said, I, I, as uh, just mentioned, I, I came here in June from Miami, and I was told, "Oh boy, you, you better watch out. Uh, it's just so dry here." That you Battery green, that better? Yeah, wow, that is better. So coming from Miami, and you know, we've got a lot of hot weather and a lot of moist weather. So coming here in June, they said, "Oh, just forget it. Your nose is going to bleed. It's just, it's going to be crazy." And then it was raining every day. So I'm like, "What's going on here?" Oh no, you have no idea. This is just the rainiest thing we've ever seen. I said, well, once, once we hit October, you'll see it. Your wife, and because my wife's really afraid of, of this upcoming winter, she said, oh, it's going to be so cold, you'll see. And we had temperatures about parallel to what Miami was having the whole time. So you have me to thank for this really abnormally great weather we've been having. So I, uh, as I said, I've um, been here for, since June and spent most of my time um, doing hurricane stuff. My background was air sea interaction at NC State. and. I did uh, winter storms and non-tropical systems, and it really translated pretty well. Uh, I ended up going in 96, working at the Hurricane Research Division uh, when Hugh Willoughby was there, and started looking at um, air-sea interaction and hurricanes, and quickly realized there's not that much there. You, get, you gotta get lucky with random buoy observations and different types of measurements. It's difficult to get down there um, uh, for many reasons, especially with manned aircraft due to the, the inherent risks involved. Um, so all right, today I'm going to talk about uh, the use of our Coyote unmanned system in Hurricane Edward. And I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, why, why we're using this in a, in a bigger context. So we're trying to do several things. One is to minimize these data gaps that we have. We, as I said, it's difficult to observe in this part of the, in, in this part of the storm. So it's a, there are several data gap areas in, in a hurricane system. But this is, I would argue, the, probably the, the most uh, critical one and the toughest one to solve so far. And by doing that, uh, we're gonna, by, by observing in this area, we're gonna improve our basic understanding, hopefully, and as a result of that, enhance the model physics. So I'm gonna give a little bit broader view of the, the enhancing the model physics and sort of the work that I'm, I'm collaborating with uh, uh, people inside NOAA and outside NOAA. We've had recent workshops. Um, uh, George was, was at that uh, workshop we had this past August to look at how we can enhance the model physics particularly for, from the operational side, but uh, not limited to that. So for the model physics evaluation and improvement, which the UAS work is definitely part of, essentially from the NOAA side of the fence, we, we really want to improve the forecast performance. That's the end goal for us. And we want to do that, though, a, a little bit differently than has been done before. Evaluation typically is looking at how model A does versus B, or how it does versus the best track. That's not an evaluation. That's, that's sort of a post-mortem. We want to look at um, how we can systematically evaluate the model itself, identify these model biases wherever they may be, document them, understand why they're there, not just uh, figure out why they're there. That, that takes time as well. And then ultimately, and this is sort of the last step, but this is a, a iterative slow process to uh, uh, eliminate those biases by implementing accurate and appropriate observationally based physical parameterizations. So just uh, from a flow, and it's my only flow chart, so I'll put you to sleep. But this is one um, way to think about it. Uh, we had our uh, lab review, and actually I went into a lot more detail, and they're like, just make it one, one slide. So there we are. 
Um, so initially, really, we want to, basic, in the most basic sense, we want to compare the model with observations. And we want to see how the physics looks from on one side of the fence to the other. Now, it's not as straightforward as that. You have to make sure that, that you're essentially looking apples to apples. So it does take even effort to really how do you compare the, the observations with the models. And we're going through that now, uh, looking at the Edward case. Um, and it's not as straightforward as you might think. We want to emphasize the, the simple stuff first. So, th so the mean structure and uh, the wave number one uh, asymmetries. And we want to do that for a few reasons. Some of them are practical. We, we have limited resources. And the second is we have, to, we have to be realistic in what we can observe. We can't look at wave number three, four, five interesting features. Don't get me wrong. Uh, some of the stuff that uh, George showed from his, uh, when he was at our workshop was, was incredible. Some of the uh, very fine scale modeling, some of the features you see are, are, are incredible. Um, but the problem is for when you're doing work like this is that's great to see, and, and we hope it's there, but is it there? So if we don't have the observations to compare it with, we can't really do those analyses. So that's something down the road. And then once we get the, you know, make, it, make the model improve, we, we see where the biases are, we see where, where problems are, and attempt to make uh, the model improvements, which again is an iterative process. You go back and forth, uh, as I'll show from a, an example of this right after this. We looked at air C interaction, and you'll see that uh, you, you can find things, but the source of the error is never uh, immediately clear why you're getting some of the results you do. So this is um, an interesting project and one will, that will take many uh, different people working on it and probably several years to get through. So then the other problem is, let's say, where we have some observation, but we have these data gap regions. And the UAS certainly fits into that, uh, where we just don't have any observations for either safety regions or it's too difficult to get in there, or we just don't have the platforms that can, that can uh, the technology is not there. Uh, and then I have toward at the end where we, we have these targeted Aussie and Aussie studies to really get a good mix of what, what types of observations and where make sense. It can, you, you can use it as an um, economic tool as well to say, uh, you know, do we need, for example, uh, we've been using these smaller UAS, and the question that always comes up is, can they replace the drop zones? Can they replace them? Well, I don't know about that, but they might be able to be part of the mix. So you may have maybe less drop zones in certain areas, and you can cost save that way or, or use your resources a little bit uh, better. And that's where that kind of work does. And then I put uh, conduct simulations to better understand model sensitivity is last. It, may, it sets a lot of people say, wait, what, why is that last? Well, in my mind, I, I'd rather have a model that's been um, fil uh, gone through and cleaned up, if you will, before I want to really look at a lot of the, the um, physical processes that that model is suggesting are important. Okay, so uh, as I said, as an example, that you know that was a flow chart. What, what did we do here? And this is just the initial stages of this. We're no, by no means are we um, absolutely done on this. But the first uh, area that we looked at was uh, air C interaction from a model evaluation standpoint, uh, mostly because that's what I do, and I can argue that it's significantly uh, um, important or critical. Uh, it's a critical region of the storm. It's where you have the energy transfer from the ocean to the atmosphere, of course. And I also think, due to uh, some a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears over the last uh, 10, 12 years to amass a data set that gives us wave number zero, at least gets us the mean structure of what the air sea environment in a hurricane looks like. Um, and obtaining that data, of course, was, is, is, uh, was difficult. You have to get little pieces, and essentially you're looking at composites. But I think we can do that. And um, we believe that if you properly scale these analyses, you should provide an accurate assessment of of um, what the model uh, air scene interaction performance is, at least relative to, the, to the, the observations that we have. So from the observational standpoint, this is a nice spaghetti plot um, of the tropical cyclone buoy database, at least as it stood uh, from 2007, from 1975. These are all different uh, storm tracks and locations. Some of them are drifter buoys. Uh, most of them are moored. Uh, fixed platforms. A large number of them obviously are relatively close to the coastline, but not all of them. We have some open ocean uh, um, platforms, and we're, we're apparently getting more according to uh, the Weather Service in the next couple of years, so that's encouraging. And we compared this with the observations you'll see. Um, it's to, to keep us moving here, essentially be you know, OBS versus model. And the model uh, output is coming from HWARF and also POM, uh, the Princeton Ocean Model. So this is the operational HWARF, and they're six hurricanes that we had, retrospective runs from um, 2011. And the storms, if you care, are Rita, Irene, Maria, Ophelia, Philippe, and Rena. 
It's nice to have your notes here. So what did we do here? What, we wanted to look at the basic measurements that we had from the observational database, which is sea surface temperature, uh, the 10 meter temperature, and then the specific humidity at 10 meters, which is the top row. Um, and what we have here for all cases, I, I'm pretty sure I was consistent. We had red as model observations and blue as the, I mean, red is model output and blue is the model, uh, the, the observations from the uh, tropical cyclone database that they have. So the first thing that jumps out is in, uh, certainly in the, la in the first two and pretty much all three across is that the uh, sea surface temperature and the temperature are warmer than what we see um, from the observations. And I should say that this is the center of the storm, this is radial distance. So essentially think of the center of the storm and going out about 500, um, actually 500 miles out there. Uh, also, what you see is that uh, you have 95% um, confidence intervals on each of the uh, uh, lines that you see, the curves you see, and also uh, one standard deviation. So for, for example, uh, for the observations, you can see the, the standard deviation plus or minus about that mean, and the same thing for the model, uh, which I'll give away the next slide, but you can see there are some differences there as well as far as the variability goes. But what's interesting here is that when you look at the bottom two panels, which is the del T and del Q, essentially the thermodynamic drivers for uh, sensible and latent heat flux, this is the difference between the sea surface temperature and the, and the air temperature, and then the difference between the specific humidity at the sea surface uh, and the specific humidity at 10 meters, which is, again, essentially driving what your um, enthalpy flux would be. You see that these, val these uh, um, differences are significant, uh, uh, certainly with del T throughout uh, the first 300 kilometers relative to, to the center of the storm. But what's interesting here is for the del Q, you see essentially they, they cancel each other out. So you, this is a good example of getting the, right, uh, getting the right answer for totally the wrong reason. So you know your SST is too warm essentially from Palm and your Q uh, within the first uh, couple hundred uh, miles of the center of the storm is, is too moist. But when you take the difference, hey, we're not bad. So. This is, when I saw this, actually, this really drove me. I said, all right, this is not good, because you won't really capture that unless you start getting into the detail like this. So if you look at this, the same data, now what, what I took here, we'll go back one. And this is just going to be, the next slide is just going to be for temperature. You can do this for Q and for SST as well. I just did it for temperature. So this is the same, um, this is center of the storm. OK, it's a little different. Uh, this is uh, closest and then farthest from the storm. So this is radial distance, if you will, too. And this is, again, for just temperature. So this is the observational temperatures, and these are the model temperatures. And this gets back to that spread you saw. And you see that there's, there, the model results are constrained, very much, at least relative to the observations. There's also a bias that you saw. Well, we saw that before. There's a the warm bias. But you also have the constrained nature. And um, those are two things that are, that are troubling to me. And we see the same thing if we look at Q10 uh, in the same way. You see these, uh, this, this constrained nature from the model output. But this probably is the most disturbing of all, I think. This is uh, a comparison between the observations and the model. These are uh, wind speeds observed between 30 and 50 meters per second, so essentially high wind cases that we have from observations. And we, took the, we kept that bound for the model, said, OK, for those six storms we had, we had 30 to 50 meters per second, constrained it there. And what you have is this, this is del Q, so that is that uh, um, enthalpy driver uh, for a thermodynamic driver, so the difference again between the specific humidity at the surface and at 10 meters. So what I wanted to do here was to see what was sort of driving the bus, if you will, the atmosphere of the ocean. And the atmosphere contribution to del Q, sort of Q10, and uh, is in red, both the model and the observations. And the, the QSST, which is the, uh, the ocean contribution to this term, is in, in black in both cases, model and observations. And if you look at the explained variance, you see that it's almost completely reversed. In the real world, we have this term at high winds being driven by fluctuations in the atmospheric moisture. But in the, in the model world, uh, and, and you see that very little, so 35%, 36% of the explained variance versus 11% for the ocean to atmosphere, and you have it almost reversed. So in the, in the model, it's about thir it's 38% of, of this explained variance versus 8% of the atmosphere here. So it's, again, uh, it's, it's out of whack as far as how the model is end up driving or what is contributing to this. 
This, if you think about it a little bit more, makes make sense too, thankfully. The, the real world observations make sense because you're talking about um, very different fluids and the, any sort of changes you're gonna get, the atmosphere is much uh, uh, more capable of changing on short time scales uh, versus a, 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 in, in this very well mixed region, the ocean is sort of set up already. So it has a hard time uh, changing. Uh, especially in this high wind region. If you get out of the lower wind region, it's, it's much different. If you go up high latitudes, it's different too. And uh, I'm gonna finish that paper, George. George is the editor for a paper that, that has this, some of this information there. I'm gonna actually, it's number one on my list to do after this seminar the rest of this week. But these results are, are pretty, um, pretty much uh, cutting, cutting edge as far as coming out in the literature, hopefully within the next uh, few months to early next year. So it's these kind of observations that makes me want to get down into that area and really observe a little bit better and to see if we can improve um, the physics of these models. And it's uh, uh, this workshop that we held in August um, was, again, we're still in the broad mode here. We're not in the UAS part of what we'll talk about, which will come up in the next couple of slides. But to look at how we can really use our observations to reduce the model physics uncertainty. And this is in, in a general sense. And we had, um, I was funded under the Sandy Supplemental Authorization, and we got a bunch of uh, uh, resources to look at uh, the unmanned systems and also to develop uh, some new technology looking at the GPS drop sounds um, and, and including some new sensor technology there to give us SST. And that was a part of what we did here, but we wanted to see, generally speaking, how can we observe better to improve the physics. So the workshop goal really was uh, to look at the, and identify areas of sort of high uncertainty within the coupled modeling system, ocean and atmosphere, that perhaps, perhaps we can minimize by modify either the strategy of obser observing, or in the case of uh, the new resources, getting these new and emerging technologies to help improve and reduce that uncertainty. So from a, from a coupled modeling perspective, we wanted to highlight a few unknown areas, and then use this upcoming um, resources, which we, we had a bunch of resources to go out in September to, to, try to try to sample a storm if Mother Nature cooperated, and, um, and to try to, to, um, to minimize the, the physics um, uncertainty that we have. Don't worry about this, this is a big deal here, but this is just an outcome from that um, uh, workshop. Uh, what I wanted people, I didn't want to come out, you know, we've all been to these workshops that are, okay, the workshop's over, see you later, thanks, that was great. We didn't want to do that. Um, we, we wanted to say, look, what are areas that we can really think we can target once we go out in the field? Again, this was August, we went out into the field in September. So we came up with, for example, uh, uh, really documenting the warm core structure of a hurricane. We don't really have that. We have, we fly, uh, not just NOAA, but uh, NCAR too, and, and, and um, and ONR has flown for years and years, but we don't really get above where we're flying to get that warm core structure. If the model doesn't get the warm core structure, you're not gonna have a very accurate prediction or you're not gonna be representing what that hurricane is very well. So we decided, look, we're gonna have the Global Hawk this year and we're gonna have uh, G4, we're gonna try to get the, our, our aircraft that um, sort of does the environment. Let's try to get some high level measurements um, so we can get a better idea of the warm core structure so that we can compare it with the models. Now, I won't go into each one, but there, each one of these is sort of let's, let's do some things here that we think we can pair it with the model. And uh, we've already got a couple of groups that are really looking at the inocial, ocean initial structure and the core, uh, ocean storm uh, structure. Again, that order zero, the main, the, not looking at the heavy, heavy detail yet, but just trying to get the basic structure right for the ocean. So, and if you're interested in these, we can talk about these offline. We definitely have openings for you know, people that want to look into some of the data that we collected. So let's talk about that. Um, the way NOAA has been operating in the last, uh, unfortunately, several years, I have to say unfortunately, is we've really concentrated on getting um, temporal continuity. And what I mean by that is we'd fly 12 hours and boom, we'd have either another plane or that same plane turned around real quick and out there so that we can initialize the models, particularly with the tail Doppler radar information that we have on both of our P3 aircraft. And it was used to uh, you know, keep keep the uh, keep putting fresh data into the models when we were out there. That that's all well and good, but this experiment did not want to do that. We wanted to take all of our assets, forget about the temporal continuity, and sacrifice that for spatial um, coverage. And we wanted to be able to really throw everything we had at it, including our plane, two planes, which we usually don't have, two P3s, and uh, Global Hawk was involved, and other planes that you'll see in a second. 
to really just give us the best kind of snapshot we could so that we could look back at the model and try at least to get an apples to apples uh, comparison to see what the model fields look like. Because if you don't do that, it's very hard. You get these little pieces of the storm and it just doesn't work. So some of the areas we were really, from a science standpoint, we were interested in air-sea energy exchange and boundary layer processes, convection in a general sense, where we look at the storm convection, sort of in, in a core high wind convection, but also rain bands and other uh, periphery type systems as well. Uh, dynamic and thermodynamic processes in the storm and the surrounding environment, because we really believe that it, you, know, you can look at the inner core environment, but you also have to know what the, um, the larger region is doing so that you can, that it, because it interacts, uh, uh, you have transfers of momentum and heat and moisture with the surrounding environment all the time. Uh, and then uh, another sort of, this is another very important area, and it's also a data void region, is cloud microphysics. And that's, a, that's another, um, I could give a whole talk on that. That's another area that's difficult to, to get to, but we have to really solve that, I think, if we want to really improve the, the operational models. Um, so we have one P3, and we know it has two P3s. One of them would, would do this inner core area, sort of like the tail dapple radar missions I mentioned initially. Um, and then we would have a second um, P3 that would sort of be an ad hoc P3 where we would determine where um, we could get better coverage or if there was areas of interest. And this is an example of an entrainment flux module. Um, the Hurricane Research Division has all these different modules of what we, we want to tackle based upon the science that we're interested in. Um, uh, and then a third aircraft we have is the NOAA G4, which is primarily responsible for capturing the, the surrounding environment. And this is a star pattern. You can see the main circulation center here. We also um, had some additional resources, as I'll explain here. These, this is just a quick little map and a cartoon here of what we had. So we did finally get into the environment. And this was a ex model evaluation experiment we ran from September 11th through the 19th of this year. And we were at two locations, which adds to the complexity. This is uh, Bermuda and this is uh, St. Croix. And uh, the, the communication issues are, you know, can be challenging, but we, uh, there are some advantages in being two different areas too. You can sample a little bit um, uh, different areas that you might not be able to from one spot. Um, and you know, thanks goes to a lot of different people for providing expendables. The, as I said, the Sandy supplemental authorization gave us a lot of resources, um, including this is the Coyote, which we'll talk about. First time I'm mentioning here. This is the small altitude. I mean, the uh, a low altitude small UAS. And this is my uh, bad representation of the Global Hawk, uh, which is uh, was uh, located out of uh, Wallops, Virginia. We, that's where it was, it was home base was. And these are our, our two aircraft, we call them 42, the NOAA P3 and 43, Miss Piggy and, and uh, Kermit. And then we have Gonzo, which is our uh, G4 aircraft that we talked about. Now we were there for many, many days, um, you know, about 10 days. I won't get into all that. that, that would take up the rest of this time here. But I wanna show what can happen if you really throw, every, throw, throw um, everything um, into the mix at once. And that's sort of what happened on the 15th. This is, uh, as I said, uh, Bermuda up here, and we have St. Croix. So we had 43 and 42 coming from different areas, attacking from uh, the north and, the, and the, uh, from the northwest and the, and the southwest. And then we also had um, Noah's uh, G4 going in. And when you do this, for those not familiar with this, we usually don't get cover coverage like this. This is extremely good coverage. So we basically sampled the entire um, storm environment, and we also had the Global Hawk, which I'll show here, that went around the system as well, even farther out. And when you do this, this is, um, uh, this is the uh, tail, uh, tail Doppler radar analyses for one kilometer, three kilometer, five kilometer, and seven kilometer for the 15th, that same day. This almost looks like a land-based WSR-88D. This is, usually do not get anything like this. And it's because we really went out of our way to sample. So this, the 15th in my mind is, um, we just originally, you know, just initially started looking at analyses and comparisons. We have not compared with the model yet, but this is the kind of uh, data we, we wanted to collect. And you know, you can see the main structure and you can see this wave number one asymmetry as well. And you can see it, uh, interesting structure, it actually rotates with, with height a little bit. So there's a lot of detail here and we're encouraged by, um, by what we have now. So. This is the type of thing that we think you know, the model physics aspects uh, and go beyond just looking at the boundary or we, we're going to have a, a, a reasonable shot at doing. So um, also we, we, you know, we can visualize this data um, pretty nicely too, in real, almost in real time on the plane. This is from 42, so this is the aircraft that I was on that we came from, um, from Bermuda from the, uh, from the north. 
And uh, this just get, gives us a transect of one of our uh, going from east to west. And what we saw from, um, you can see we go through that um, convective burst here. And we can see that um, is a, the radar cross section for that um, mission. And um, so we, we, uh, we have a fair amount of detail in the vertical as well for this particular flight. Uh, as I said, we, we also had um, the, the G4, which is our corporate aircraft, basically. And you can see the significant amount of di differences. These are uh, skew T plots down here. So this uh, is looking at observations very close to the core, and you're pretty well saturated, uh, and you have a much different profile as you start looking at uh, observations that are not too far out uh, from the core. But uh, you can start seeing interacting with this dry air, which is the lighter colors and the moist air. Um, moist environment is the, the, the reds and oranges. And you can start to see some of that uh, influence here. And um, you also see it uh, uh, on the, this sort of inflow jet uh, on this side uh, as well as uh, to the north of the system. So does the model pick up on this kind of detail? Does it, does it get that there's, it's pretty saturated near the core, but um, just, just outside that, there, there's a much different environment? So much so that uh, you can see some of the uh, observations that we had from the Global Hawk, which was flying for two days, you can fly that long. So our missions are you know, on station for a few hours, several hours, but the Global Hawk can stay up for quite a long time. And it, uh, in this case, we did a storm survey and a storm sampling pattern. And now, uh, similar time frame, you can see that we, we were kind of concentrating in here, but when you take these observations just outside in this region, you can see that you have a much drier environment, more stable environment um, uh, than, than we just had, you know, maybe 100 kilometers outward from, from the P3. So can we see this? Those, the, are we actually capturing this um, in our forecast systems? So this is the kind of thing we want to look at. We also, you know, for those interested in the ocean, we also took a lot of ocean measurements, and we took a pre-storm uh, ocean survey um, uh, on the 12th. This was a couple of days, three days before we actually got into the storm. Um, and this is uh, what the storm looked like. Uh, keep in mind, though, you know, this is the storm down here. We're sampling up here. The next slide will show a little bit better. These are the initial conditions, the pre-storm and ocean conditions. And so again, this is where the track ended up going. We didn't know that at the time. We had to base it on the forecast track. And um, we sampled here to try to get out here, and knowing that we would sample there later to try to get a pre-storm initial condition um, to compare with. And there's a pattern of um, AXBT, CTDs, and um, current profiles that we put down. Um, and after the storm, so I jumped before, now this is after actually. The stuff, I'm not really gonna show the in-storm because that was sort of the, like when we were flying on the 15th and 16th, we also were dropping ocean probes. So we sort of have the in-storm as part of our regular operations. Uh, we can drop ocean probes uh, from the P3s we can do that. So this is the post-storm environment. And uh, as I said, two days after uh, the storm passage, and you can, this is comparing the pre-storm here and with the post-storm. So you can see we had pretty good overlap in the same area. Uh, so we can kind of hopefully give us a good before and after look. And this is the actual track we lucked out. And a lot of times you, we don't look out, the, the track was well behaved. So we are comp comfortable and confident that we're gonna be able to give us at least again that order zero comparison of what the initial conditions were for the model. And out here, I think personally we'll see, but it, it, I think we're really gonna see some dramatic differences between the observations that we initialize with, with based on these observations, compared to what the model typically uses, which is gonna to have to heavily rely on uh, altimetry and um, um, climatology, which as we all know who have used those data, that's not usually a, a good first go-to if you're looking at an operational, uh, looking at a model to initialize. So this is the post-storm ocean wake that we see. And um, it, uh, you can see there's, a little, there's more cooling that occurs. The, now a lot of that has to do with two factors that the storm got stronger as it moved farther north and also you're moving farther north, so you don't have as much warm water to, to, um, to mask that um, cooling signal. Okay, finally, the coyote. So what, what are we doing with the coyote? We're, we're, again, this fits well into this, this larger scheme of things. We want to uh, use it to better understand, evaluate, and initialize, and um, probably, probably in that order, uh, better understand and get an initial understanding of what's happening, evaluate the models based upon this relative to what we're seeing, and then lastly is to use, the initial, use this data to initialize, which uh, is a complicated process because you really have to look at what the data assimilation schemes are, and then that in itself is a, uh, sometimes a can of worms. 
So some of, these are the flight patterns, the top pattern here for this eye pattern we did. This is actually, compared to this, this is the eye wall, so the high wind region of the storm. And this is actually a schematic or cartoon of what we expected or what we wanted to do with the P3. So this is sort of the mothership. The way this aircraft works is we launch it out of the, um, the existing AXBT tubes. The, this is where we launched the probes for the ocean. And uh, the Navy developed this technology probably about uh, 10 years ago. And they told the, the, the company that did it, now called Sensitel, originally it was Advanced Ceramics, then they became BAE, now they're back to being small again and they're called Sensitel. And they had to develop this so that the, you know, the Navy said, we don't want to change anything, we want to use what we have. So uh, upwards of $5 million was to, just to design it, which NOAA did not do that. Uh, we kind of got in uh, after that back. And since we both use P3s, long story, but interacting with them uh, on the side, I said, look, we'll horse trade. The way this, the, this project got going is I, I said, we have P3 hours we can give you, and you have some aircraft you want to trade. And we made a trade back five years ago and did a clear air test. And that was sort of the beginning of it. We didn't have money for a while until this Sandy Supplemental Resource came along, and I put in a proposal to try to test this technology. So that's the, the history of this. Um, the, the two uh, cartoons you see here are, one is the eye wall. So if you imagine the P3 dropping at a 10,000 feet, um, this aircraft, and, it, and then it sprout, comes in this tube and will you know, sprout its wings and fly. It's outfitted with a payload that's similar to a GPS sonde, has a pressure, temperature, winds, and humidity, and um, it will spiral down. Think of, uh, for those who have to visualize at home, think of sort of a party hat where you come out and you're just kind of getting wider and wider and wider as you're going down into the eye, and then eventually at the end you punch into the eye wall. Uh, that was uh, the con op, the concept of operations we have. And the second one experiment that I'll show is an inflow experiment, which was uh, looking to essentially use the, the inflow of how a parcel of air would, would spiral into the storm and have this um, small, only a 13 pound aircraft, five foot wingspan aircraft spiral into the center. Because um, the patterns that we typically do with the P3, you know, you have a manned aircraft, you can, you can cut through the storm and do what you want. You have to be more creative when you have a 13 pound aircraft. So um, from, from the evaluation part, you know, looking at how these, these data can help us, the big thing from, from a forecast and from an understanding standpoint, particularly from a forecast standpoint, let's stick with that, is really to enhance the existing thermodynamic coverage. If you think about what we can observe in a hurricane when we fly through, below 500 meters, the tail Doppler radar doesn't work all that well, so we don't get a lot of winds. That's one. The second thing is we get almost no thermodynamic data. The only thermodynamic data we get is from the drop sons themselves, these point measurements. So the, the model, but the model has to be initialized somehow. So there's a big disparity between what we observe and what we can get from the thermodynamics. So that's really the, the driving mechanism. There's several uh, operational benefits that go beyond the thermodynamics. That is, can we maybe capture rapid intensity change by hanging out in the eye and looking at the, you know, uh, the, the, uh, as, as the storm is intensifying before the winds um, increase, we might have a, you know, an hour or so uh, warning on that for intensification. Uh, also, uh, we will get better winds because we're simply, t essentially, the way I say it to, um, to non-scientific, don't take this uh, personally, to, but you guys are obviously scientifically very capable, but when I, when I present this to media, I say, look, it's the difference between a snapshot and a movie. You're taking this snapshot, and you're trying to get maximum winds. Now, what do you think you're gonna do? You're gonna get higher winds if you take a bunch of snapshots? every once in a while in certain areas, or if you take a movie. And essentially what we're doing by having continuous observations, we're essentially staying down and giving, giving us a movie of where, where these max winds would be. And this is what's very critical to the Hurricane Center. So there are a lot of different observations and, and, and things we can use this uh, type of platform for. And this just shows, gets back to the thermodynamic significance. Um, a colleague of mine at HRD gave me this plot. This is for a Hurricane Ernesto, um, an ensemble run. Um, looking at just uh, you know sensitivity to various, uh, we have sea surface temperature. Here's the control, and what we did was looked at when you tweaked. Uh, well, I didn't do it, but whoever ran these simulations, you could see that the biggest impact is moisture. When you have a, a plus or 10 percent change in relative humidity within the within the boundary layer of the hurricane, you can have some significant impacts with regard to the um, forecast. This is a 120-hour forecast. And this is a tropical storm strength in category four. So you can see a significant difference. And this is sort of the justification for, for having this from the thermodynamic standpoint. So we finally got in there. We actually flew on the first time we ever had an air deployed UAS mission into a hurricane. 
and it happened to be a major hurricane. It's only a major, uh, Edward was a major hurricane, I, I think for six hours, and we happened to be in there during that six hours, which is kind of crazy. Um, so we flew 14Z on the 16th, and um, we had, uh, as I said, used our 42 aircraft as a deployment vehicle. Um, the duration of this flight was 28 minutes. The maximum duration we think is, it, it's complicated because it depends on if it's getting help from the winds and, and sort of gliding more than, than flying. Um, although this air, particular aircraft is not a very good glider. Um, you'll see in the next experiment we got a lot longer. We only had 28 minutes and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we had some significant communication issues when we ended up losing communications after 20 minutes, 28 minutes with the aircraft. Uh, we got down to 896 meters. We wanted to go a lot, lot lower than that, but due to the fact that we lost the aircraft pretty early, we didn't get lower than that, but that's still um, pretty, we're definitely a successful mission, and we measured 100 knots at 971 meters um, in the southwest eye wall, which is a platform record for the Coyote. This is a little, I gotta get a better plot. I, sorry, I, I, I've had a hard time trying to superimpose. You can see the, this is the Coyote aircraft, and this is these are various satellite in, um, uh, renditions at the time, very close to it. So the timing's not there, but somehow it's something off, because I can guarantee we were in the eye. We were not on the edge of the eye. So it might have to do with the incident angle of, the, of how the satellite image is taken, or the, this particular, these particular images were not exactly 1445, but um, we, we ended up going into the eye, um, spiraling around, so uh, something like that, and then eventually, sort of like the schematic was before, and getting into the eye wall. Um, but what's interesting, I said, is we lost communications. We were using 900 mega, megahertz um, RF to, with the aircraft, which works perfectly well, and I, you know, I wanna talk with Terry after, after this, um, this talk here about why it's so poor. I mean, we, we can have 100 mile range or more with um, simple drop sounds when we drop them from the aircraft and have no problems with getting the data and communicating. Um, yet, but our range here was limited to five to seven miles, which really made it very difficult. We had to have the P3 within that range. We have Iridium, which is satellite communications. That was our backup. Uh, and that didn't work all that well. It worked, but then we would lose communications. So these are some of the issues we really got to tackle out, and I would say this is probably the biggest issue um, for us going forward is this improve the communications. That said, we got some great data. So this is a time series, um, 33 minutes. Uh, this is basically constitutes that 28 minute period. A um, little busy here, I'll explain it. We've got wind direction and we've got wind speed here. And then I threw in, just to give you an idea, this is height in meters divided by 10. So this is 150, this is 1500 meters, just less than sort of after we got, we dropped out of the aircraft and then we stepped down and did these steps. Uh, and then the wind speed here, you can see five to 10, at most 15 knots in the eye itself. And we see this interesting ramping up region. It's not a discontinuous eye wall, if you will. You really do have a noticeable, this is about a, um, a 10 to 15 kilometer region going from uh, um, five to 10 knots to 100 knots. So it's pretty quick, but it's not instantaneous either. And these big drop offs here, the, the reason we don't have these, these uh, we lost communications between these times and then eventually we lost communications here. So this is in the eye wall region, and this is ramping up in the eye and then ramping up. You can see wind direction here. This sort of makes sense too, if you think about, I'm gonna use this little schematic here. So we drop here, so the aircraft did something like that, pretty much like it is here, and maybe not as many loops, maybe one loop. And you got, you would expect here, you got south, southeasterly flow as you come here, then it turns easterly, which is here, and then it should turn uh, to uh, eventually uh, out of the north, which we do here, as you, we lost communications here. But if you continue to go down, you're about zero. Uh, and then eventually out of the south, southwest, which is what you would see here as it's in the eye wall. So uh, performed pretty well as far as the, um, the way we got winds and wind, particularly wind direction. Um, and um, the wind speed, as I said, you can see it ramping up to about, and that's where it had the maximum of 100 knots. So interesting stuff, we can also, I'm really look, interested in looking at the thermodynamics here of that, this transfer across that eye, eye wall boundary, which I have not jumped into the thermo. George? Two questions, just of interest. Uh, do you pre-program the flight strategy before you let it go, or are you able to um, on the fly? No, we, we totally have like a, a, a plan, if you will, okay? So like, this is our plan here. And, but it's not pre-programmed to the point where it's just on its own. No, we measure, we make, we, we totally are adjusting on the fly. Do you need instructions to 
and we, you have to almost. If you don't, it, would, um, it wouldn't work. No, it definitely requires um, a lot of work. If we had satellite communications and a really good data visualization where we can get instantly communicating, which is another issue we want to work on, visualization, you could do it from the moon. Well, if you had internet on the moon. You could do it from anywhere, on the, anywhere in the world, and you, could, you don't have to be there. You know, so we eventually imagine this somewhere, maybe at the Hurricane Center, where they can, and even give commands, like, well, can you guys go over here? We want you. Yeah, they could do that. So, I mean, the, the potential is pretty crazy. And um, your other, other question. What's the uh, frequency of the data? That, uh, that, that's another issue. We, the maximum um, transmission rate from Iridium is one hertz. So we're, uh, the data pipe is sort of limited there. And we don't have a buffering capability right now. So, but the instruments, are, yeah, they're about, they're typical, that, I'd lean on Terry here, they're typical, um, the four hertz is for the uh, temperature and moisture, um, and I believe pressure as well. So it's four hertz, but we can do better than that. There's other stuff out there, I believe. Uh, two hertz for CPU and four hertz for Okay, so two and four. But we hopefully can do better than that, I hope, going forward. Because one thing that uh, I was talking before the seminar is, you know, we. We flew nine, I want to get down here. And if we can get 10 hertz data, maybe, and transmit that and get, actually get it back, maybe direct measurements uh, of fluxes in an eye wall is not unreasonable. I mean, right now, you know, we've never done that, obviously, but um, I think it's possible if we can get some of these technical issues worked out. So, um, yeah, so let me get on to the next one. We can come back and talk about this later, but this was, um, but definitely a success because we, you know, we, we wanted to see, can we do this? Will it survive? It survived. Remember, this thing is tiny. It's five feet across, 13 pounds. It survived. It didn't, it, you know, we, the communication was the issue. It survived fine you know, in 100 knot winds. So the second one we did, we did a, a second mission. And as I said, this was um, more of an inflow experiment. And this was the next day. And we lasted 68 minutes. Hey, yeah, great. We solved all our problems. Well, not really. We had to get creative. We knew the communication districts were really significant. So we had to make sure, and I'll show you the flight tracks here. You can see we're uh, by the P3, we're pretty interesting. So we got down this time to 400 meters. Well, we got down to zero because we actually splashed. So we, I can show you that. I'm gonna look at that uh, profile um, profile as it's coming down later. I haven't done that yet. But we did, so this isn't a maximum wind case, but we did, um, uh, we were able to at least look at sort of an inflow channel uh, or what re close to one that we think. So this is where the pattern, a lot of lines here. This is what the P3 did. Uh, we came from Bermuda. At this point, remember Bermuda was north of the system. So um, now this storm is uh, on the 17th has passed Bermuda and is accelerating towards Europe essentially or Nova Scotia. Um, but before it got there, we, we were able to sample it one more time. And on this leg is where we did the Coyote launch. We launched up here. It's hard to, I mean, I don't want to get into details, but. We really, I, it was uh, just trying to see if the concept works. In reality, if I had to do it again, I would probably drop here so we get closer. We didn't get into the eye wall here, and we had some delays with um, uh, the launch sequence, and, and it ended up impacting us. So there's some issues here operationally we need to get through. But the bottom line is we want to see if the concept worked. So we were able to launch here, we splashed here, just outside the secondary eye wall that was um, in place at the time. Um, but I'm more interested in, in seeing what the thermodynamic looks look like in this part, and we'll we'll have some measurements to, to share. Um, oh, I apologize for this because this is the best slide I had, and it didn't show up, and I have to have to have it. Okay, good. So this is part of the present. It's not coming up, is it? Slide what? Man, let me try something. Comes out blank here, right? Let me just, no, it's not gonna work. Oh well, that really stinks. Well, when I go back into here, I mean, I'll show you what it, there is right now. It just, uh, it, it was an insert, it was a PDF that I had. See, maybe it 
by magic it will come up. Doubt it. Yeah. This was it. This is. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, but I, all I can I can show you afterwards. I really apologize. That's, if I had to pick one slide that I wanted to work, that was it. But that's how that works sometimes. Technology. It was a, basically a time series of. Um, you know what? Let me try one more thing. I'm not going to give up. Maybe, maybe. It won't have relative humidity. This one, but if it works, I'll take it. It has temperature and everything else. And if it doesn't, I'm, I apologize. Let's see. Yeah, cool. All right, my apology. I actually had relative humidity on here too. We don't have it, but I'll take what I'll take it. So we have everything except for relative humidity on here, which uh, shows similar types of perturbations than this. You know, this scale went up to 100, and it, you saw interesting things. I'm not sure that it was, it was as interesting as uh, some of the other stuff. So what we have here is temperature in blue, and um, this again, this is height. So we're essentially at 750 meters, and then we step down, and then it well steps down pretty dramatically as it expires. Um, and uh, what's interesting here is I'll jump to this is we weren't expecting to get this. We don't have any SST measurement capabilities on there, but the sensor that was measuring temperature measured SST. We know that because, well, first of all, drop it increased two degrees at the splash, and that was the only point we saw that. And secondly, we had a BT measurement that was uh, in that range too, in the 24, uh, 24 between 24 and 25 degrees Celsius. Remember, we were pretty far north at that time, so this is actually a pretty cold uh, environment. So, um, which you, you have pretty interesting fluctuations. This is along that inflow channel what we, we were deeming an inflow channel. And this, again, is time in minutes. So you see these pretty radical fluctuations in temperature. You get a, a degree cooling, in some cases, on the order of less than a minute, significantly less than a minute, maybe 30 seconds or so. Um, and then a pretty significant jump back. We have to do, obviously, more uh, cleaning up of this. But one thing that's encouraging to me is this is, this little, this is wind speed here. And you see this bump in wind speed, which is um, which was with a band that we had gone through. So that was verified by the, the, the Doppler that we had on there and some drops. And as you see this, there was also some significant precip associated with this. And you see this commiserate sort of um, evaporative cooling that occurs uh, during that time. So I think the sensor um, is operating pretty well. Um, and you also see a general increase, but not that much, because this, this, this storm is really not, uh, is sort of going through the, the decreasing phase at this point. Maximum winds are um, about 75 to 80 knots. But really, just to show the, the level of detail and the types of observations we can make, we can never fly at 750 meters. Um, and we want to fly down here. We want to fly a whole lot lower. And we want to fly this info channel all the way into the eye and then into the eye wall and then into the eye, which is, but we're taking baby steps. So we're, we're comfortable. We're, um, we're, we're confident that a lot of these observations are reasonable. Um, I've done a few point measurements comparing temperature and winds. We had some drops that we from the P3 that we, we can slice through here. Um, and we also have this as a sounding, as if you will, at least in the lower boundary layer, that we can compare with, um, with some of the drops that we had right at the end of this. So this was another sort of just a conceptual uh, experiment that, again, succeeded. We went 68 minutes, which was uh, a record for this platform. Uh, and uh, there's a lot more to do that we can do um, with this type of information. George. Well, this is, well, yeah, we went down, I think, at about 64 or so. So you're saying here? I know, yeah, this, this little blip. Rapid increase in yeah, I would, I would be suspicious of that based on the fact that we, uh, we went down. Um, possible. This I totally believe. This is more realistic looking, and we, we verified that. This one, I have not looked into that. Um, if I had RH, there's another thing here. It's fluctuating, and absolutely when we get here, it pins at 100. So what I'm wondering is this thing's coming down and it maybe the sensor is pointing down and it's getting hit by uh, you know, the exposure issue with regard to the payload. 
And no, I, I would be a little suspicious of that. Um, but we'll have to look at that. You know, and I think that these are sort of the, some of the technical issues that we want to, um, maybe, maybe the housing can be designed a little, or we can go down in a spiral instead of, maybe, maybe we were nose diving. I'm not even sure I have to ask how we descended. We descended pretty darn quickly, as you can see. Um, and then obviously at this point, it's, it's not, I said control. This is a, basically the, the lowest level we had control, which is about four, four, uh, 400 meters. But this is all just free fall. Well, gliding, but it doesn't glide. This thing's a terrible glider. Um, what happened after the splash? Was it lost we got SST for two data packets. That, that, that's what happened after. But after, after that happened, <laughs> fish, some fish looked at it kind of weird, I guess, maybe, as it was sinking. Yeah, we don't recover these. It's just um, probably the most popular question I get. But one reason we don't is it's just how do you find this thing? You know, the, it's not worth recovering from the data standpoint, just the corrosion and all that. And, and then just logistically, how do you get out there? You know, it's not going to flow, continue to flow. No. And um, we're being recorded. So I'll give you another reason why we don't want to do that later. But um, <laughs> it's actually a pretty good reason. So no, we, they, we want these things to kind of go away. Um, but uh, we want to also get them cheap, too. So we want to work on uh, reducing the cost of these, which I look at as from a data per minute type of argument. And already, it's comparable to SAN. SAN stays up four or five minutes. And we've got 68 minutes here. That's pretty valuable data in, in, a, in a concept of operations that a SAN will never give you. Um, you know, this is, to me, I, I uh, get on my horse here for a second, preach a little bit is that I look at this as sort of potentially, not these experiments per se, but you could look at this sort of like as an MRI was developed. You know, the MRI came out and you can really look at, um, doctors have been diagnosing bodies for centuries, but it gave a, a new way to diagnose. And I think that this is gonna let us do a, a new way of diagnosing, mostly because we can direct it where we want it to go. You know, we can't do an eye wall orbit right now. The P3's not gonna do that. There's no other aircraft that can do that. The sun, G GPS sun's not gonna do that. What does that look like? How, does the, how do the fluctuations in wind occur in that main region? What do the thermodynamics look there? That eye wall interface, what are the exchanges going on between temperature, moisture, momentum? Uh, you know, we, we just don't know that. We can do it with the model. We can slice the model up and dice the model up, but we don't have an observational equivalent. So I think that this really is a tool that if we, if we get a lot of the technical glitches out of the way and work with it, I think has a lot of potential for learning. And for basic research, I'm allowed to say that. I'm from NOAA, basic research. I love being here to be able to say that. With no operational connection to it at all. It of course has operational connections, but even just from a basic understanding. So what worked? Okay, so the lessons learned from the coyote, uh, the green and red, uh, green being what worked. So I had a lot of people saying, look, that, Joe, nice try, but this thing's 13 pounds, it's five feet, it's just not, it's not gonna work. You're going into a crazy environment. Well, nope, it worked, it did work and it survived, and it can survive. Um, you know, pressure, temperature, and wind measurements, we need to look at it more for sure, but they, at first look, and even second look, they compare very favorably with other known observing systems, particularly the GPS sondes we had, and from the wind standpoint, where we can compare was the TDR, the tail Doppler radars. Um, very few flight operational limitations. This is, this is a sort of a lesson learned for if NCAR wants to get into this business, is you know, you got a lot of universities that want to fly these things, but in the national airspace, it is tough. There's all sorts of regulations. And one advantage we have here is that we really, given that we're NOAA and where we're and where we're flying, both, we really don't have some of the limitations, and we can we can really fly this concept, um, you know, going forward, which is a really big plus. There's a lot of other people that want to fly these things, but just can't. We can. So the inflow con op, the second one I did, um, I think it's the winner. That one in the eye was a pain. It was very difficult to, to observe. It was, it was very hard to get the P3 to work with us. Um, and um, you know, so, so I think that that, uh, that, that, that is the, the inflow. It doesn't have to be an inflow experiment, too. We can drop a lot closer to the eye wall, be inflow for 10 minutes in any eye wall. But I think that that type of let it fly on its own into the storm is, is a better way to go. Um, the preliminary analysis from uh, work that uh, Terry has been involved with, had, um, we have an IR sensor on the existing GPS sonds, which was part of the work that was funded. We want to use that, and we think, we hope that that, that technology can be put on the Coyote sooner rather than later, maybe this year. Um, we'd like to at least try it and investigate that. So this would allow us to get air-sea coupling, which would be huge. So we think that that is a realistic possibility. 
All right, what needs work? We have to improve the communication robustness. This is an absolute must. We have about five mile range with the UAS and the P3, just unacceptable. We cannot have that. Um, I'm gonna show you before the last slide, I, I forgot to notate it. When I showed you where we were doing the inflow experiment, I wanna show you the P3 tracks. You're gonna see what we had to do to pull that experiment off, which was crazy um, for the P3. To maintain that five, five mile range, we were constantly looping back because the P3 flies at 250 knots or so, ground speed, and then the UAS was going at 50 knots. So we. How do you know the range is five miles? Because we kept losing it after about five miles. Yeah, lost it, got it back in again. Lost it, you know, maybe seven miles on a good day. Depends on how. Yeah. Um, so, and this one is a little more, I, I don't know more, but it's disappointing too because the iridium wasn't working and people were saying, well, it's because of the ram. No, the iridium shouldn't matter. The rain, we break. That's not, that's, that's not an answer. I don't know what that is. It has to do with the, the, the antenna. Uh, again, this is why we really can rely on you guys. And, you know, we used iridium. I, I flew a UAS long time ago, 10 years ago, which is like 1,000 years in UAS technology time. And we used Iridium and it worked fine. It was like a cell phone call. We had 18 hours of satellite communication and we dropped out maybe 20 times for three minutes. It worked. I don't know what's happening here. So these are problems. We gotta figure these out. The data, I'm almost embarrassed uh, a little bit to say this. We don't have any data buffering on there. So when we lose communications, we lose data. Shouldn't be laughing, but it's, that's gotta end. We cannot have that. Um, again, this was version 1.0, so I accept it, but we're moving forward, we can't have that. Um, we got to get. Uh, we have to be able to be able to transmit um, the data as well. We're limited by the iridium um, pipe, if you will. But the the 900, uh, the RF pipe is 25 hertz, so we should be able to transmit anything we want uh, at at high speeds. We have to improve the system awareness. This gets back to that visualization issue. There were issues on the P3. That we, you know, the pilots weren't exactly sure where we were at the same time. We had to do a lot of verbal communication. There was some visual, but it was kind of clunky. So we need to get better system awareness. This is sort of an internal to no issue. But if we ever want to move off the planes and, and use satellite, then we need to do this anyway. We also investigate the, again, relative humidity is always a problem. I probably don't have to tell anyone here. It's always the problem variable. And yet again, it may be, there may be some issues with that. It may be just the sensor location relative to the uh, payload configuration, I'm not sure. But we have to look at that. And maybe how we're, we're doing the operations. And, um, but we'll have to look into that. And then standardized appropriate, uh, this is an internal issue. I won't get into it enough time. I could talk later. We, um, these guys didn't, never flew on a, a, a P3 before. So this is the first time we flew the UAS out of a P3. They flew on other aircraft. And there were some operational launch sequence issues. We lost two of these, I didn't tell you that. And they wholly had to do with the fact that this aircraft was tumbling the UAS before it got situated. And the sequence uh, released it from while it was tumbling and it couldn't orient itself. And it, it, it was an expensive lesson to learn because we just basically had to wait another 10 seconds before it stabilized. But these are the things you learn in the field. Uh, but we have to come up with something. I'm st I still want to be 100% sure we're past that because I don't want to lose any more aircraft. So um, what are some, maybe some next steps? These are suggestions. These are, that's why I got question marks everywhere here. Um, I, I would talk with uh, Rick Carbone uh, about two weeks, three weeks ago. And you know, he told me, um, I hope I'm allowed to say this, but he, that NCAR's interested in getting into the UAS business to some degree and to looking to, you know, and, uh, there's a lot of interest from the universities to get into UAS, but really don't want to get into the platform building um, mode. And I agree with that. If that, that. That's what he told me and I agree. So what he told me was, look, we'd like to see people that are operating now, get lessons learned, figure out what you're doing so that if we're going to fund something, we know the risks are involved, what are involved and, and maybe maybe we don't do it or maybe we do it. Um, and then also um, interested in the, the technological side, the communications, the sensors. So there's, I think there's a lot of areas we can build on. So I, I, we could use help from the engineering and technical sides. We're not that strong in that area. So as I said, we have the communication enhancements, the sensor upgrades, and then data specific improvements, onboard buffering, et cetera, et cetera. And really, this is, I mean, really, we could use your help tremendously. And what we could share is, you know, our operational experiences with real world missions and demonstration projects. We love to share this with you. It could be helpful data points as, as uh, NSF and NCAR starts to delve into this uh, UAS driven research that, that, that it may want to fund in the future. Uh, what, what concept of operations work? What systems don't work? What you want to avoid? 
and we're happy to share that. So much so that if you want direct involvement in it, and fly with us if you want, come fly with us. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so little as much interaction as you want, open book, uh, looking at the data, doing stuff, happy to share that. Uh, and then maybe in the future, you know, we'll, beyond that, we can look at sort of payload miniaturization issues, um, sensor developments, new sensors, infield testing. We don't just have to stay in hurricanes either. I'm talking about hurricanes here, but you know, NOAA, especially now where I am, we do polar stuff. We look at, so we can look at the tropics, we can look at UAS and polar sensors up in that part of there. We can look at storm, boundary layer, quiescent modes, uh, a lot of different things. So I think there's a lot of areas that we can um, interact. And um, you know, I, I think that uh, it, the, the sky's the limit. Uh, before, I, before I go to the questions here, and I'm done, is I just wanted to get back, did I go too far? Probably, yeah. Um, where we had that one coyote flight, the inflow flight. Yeah, it went way too far back. Sorry. Yeah, this one. If you can, you probably can't see it, but this is the P3 flight. This is how we normally fly, these lines, right? Okay, they're a little wavy. But if you notice here to here, you see all these loops? These are all crazy loops so that we would not lose. This is a figure eight. That was my favorite one right there, right there, go looping back. And we just were constantly doing that just so that we didn't get out of range with, uh, with the aircraft. Um, that was some great flying. Uh, they, you know, they could have said, you're crazy, we're not doing this, but they did. Pilots were amazing. So anyway, uh, with that, I'm, I'm done. Be happy to answer any questions uh, you may all have or talk afterwards. Thank you. I think we have questions. A little bit of time for questions. You showed data from uh, two flights and said you lost two. Yep. Uh, what is the cost per uh, vehicle? All right, I'm going to, I ask, that's my second most uh, asked question. All right, so if you're, if you're talking about a Corvette, right, the next generation Corvette, do you ask how much that one costs or what the production cost is going to be? Because that Corvette's probably 10 million bucks or whatever they're doing. So not that we're anywhere near that. So I think it's a little unfair because, I mean, the price that we have now for these that are rolled up, um, you know, we're going to get, they're, they're going to be high five digit numbers at this point, prototype. But that includes getting these guys to, to getting the, the, design, the, the manufacturer to come out and operate it. That includes um, whatever payload you want. That includes um, clear air testing. That includes um, everything that's part of getting that thing out there. We do think right now, and this is from the manufacturer, that we're going to get to about 10,000. I think we're going to get to about 5,000. When we get to about 10 to 5,000, we're talking at a minimum two hours duration, possibly four hours. So you start doing the math on this. You know, the, the, the data per minute argument is a real, it's not just a, trying to be slick, it's, I think it's realistic. You can, you're paying $150 a minute with SANS right now. It's pretty expensive. So if you get down to about, I think the, the numbers come close to about 13,000 or so for an hour and change, you're breaking even. So if you get down to two hours, you know you're 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 getting well below that. And I think that the advantages you have with this platform too are that you can direct it. And those aren't trivial advantages; those are huge advantages. You can put it where you want it to put it. And we could put different sensors on there too. I'm not sure the, the GPS platform has that capability beyond what it has now. So how do you measure wind speed? That's the uh, that's you guys are getting some tough questions. That is the, the a black to me it's a black box. I will say this. When I compare it, it compares phenomenally well. I will say that. The basic answer to that is you essentially have to pull out the autopilot flight data and whatever is remaining, because it has GPS on there as well, is the winds. Um, has it got a Peter tube it, to measure its own airspeed, or is that just assumed? It, it does, not ha does not have a pitot tube. Um, it, it has G a GPS uh, on there, on board. And it has a very complicated autopilot. Uh, responses are sort of like, I think, between 250 and 500 hertz. So it's constantly adjusting. Um, so much so that if we want to do fluxes, just to, you didn't ask this, but I, I, if we ever want to do fluxes, we have to dumb that down because we, it's going to be really hard to get W and I mean W prime because this thing is constantly trying to, like, for example, it wants to stay at a certain altitude and something hits it, it's adjusting for that. But we, we want to know what that was because that was the environmental forcing 
that is going to give us the information that we need for vertical motion. So if the autopilot is too smart or too quick, it really impacts our ability to get the atmospheric data out of it. But that said, to get back to your original question is, in a, in a very general sense, and I can, you know, we can work with the engineers, and I've asked this, them too. A lot of this is proprietary stuff too. This this autopilot, which is made by Piccolo, which is universal. These guys are making a lot of a lot of uh, uh, autopilots for 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 these types of systems. You essentially have to remove that information, which is recorded, and they have it. And what you remain with is 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 your you know, the, the basic GPS, so that it can give you what the winds would have been. I hope that's satisfying. It's not even that satisfying to me. I have honestly. ten thousand other questions. <laughs> On the uh, second flight that was 68 minutes long, what was the, uh, and if you're shooting for like two to four hours, what was the limiting factor on that 68 minute flight that? Ended Great question. Um, if you noticed, if you if you looked real hard, you know, my, my schematic had a, you know, an inflow curving in, and then, you know, you spiral in, but that actually beelined right in. And the software that was developed for that is called Heading Hold. And basically, it's pretty elegant the way it's supposed to work, is that you tell the UAS, hey, here's the center. This is the center, we're gonna give you this, go towards it. And the second part of the, the, the software uh, uh, solution would be keep the winds at your tail. Those can be competing terms, because if you're saying go with this, go at, go at the center, but keep, keep the winds at my tail, it, you know, from that standpoint, it, it overrode and said go to the center as being the dominant part of that software. So it essentially said I can go to the center. These winds are light enough out here, 30, 40 knots. I can overpower that, and I, I can get in there. That relates to your question is because we were essentially getting hit by crosswinds constantly. So if we were able to have the winds at our tail for that major part of that, and then as you get closer to the center, maybe have look at the center and, and try to point towards there and get there. Because when you start to get 50, 60, 80 knots, it's gonna have to try to keep uh, crabbing in towards the center. But when it's far away, the winds are weak enough that it can just go straight at it. So I think that we had some inefficient uh, software that, uh, or, or, or concept, I guess. Uh, the concept is good to spiral in, but the software wasn't mimicking what we wanted it to do. So if you had the winds at its tail, I think we would have gotten 90 minutes or so, I would have bet. One last quick question. What was the indicated airspeed at these low altitudes? Um, fast typically, fast typically uh, we were going at, uh, that's a good question, we were about 30 something knots. Um, so we were probably about um, 80, 80 knots or so. When we were in the eye wall, it was, uh, the ground speed was um, mm. about 160 knots. Because we were, you know, with, with the wind then, not by choice, but the, the thing is just getting carried around like a stick at that point. It has no choice. It has to follow the wind. I think since we started, we're already kind of late. So I think we'll, okay. have, even though, but I'm sure, but you'll be around for the rest of the afternoon? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm here till I think 2 o'clock or so. So, so people have an opportunity to play. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you, everybody.